Got it. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? It's good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, yeah, I'm so excited. Uh, my name is Rachel George and um, I have an artist in residency with the Wild for Trust and I'm just so happy to be with my mentors here and if you guys want to introduce yourselves. I'm Tanya Carter and I'm from both the Slate with Tooth uh, Nation uh, ancestrally and from Nakomox up in um, Spazum area. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here. I, I mean, the other part is, you know, studying a lot of writing to be able to feel confident doing what matters. I have a um, master's in theater, which was done in oratory and dance and um, a world literature degree. Yeah, world literature. Can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> that she's the most educated person in this room. <laughs> Somebody asked me if I have a PhD and I said honorary kind. <laughs> My name is Miracle and um, I've been an author for a long time uh, and I, I've done a lot of teaching but I've gotten those teaching positions through my authorship not through uh, my superb education although I have to say I have 10 years of university but I took courses that allowed me to discuss indigenous oratory and so I didn't get a degree in anything but I got all kinds of sociology <laughs> political science economics I even did ancient economics in North America, which is the potlatch system and the, you know, the Mexican potlatch system and so on and so forth. So I, I am educated, just not, uh, not usefully. <laughs> no, <laughs> not certified. But not certified. Knowledge. <laughs> and uh, I'm Columpa Bob. I am primarily a clown. <laughs> I've got all, going on 35 years in the theater primarily. I have uh, studied West Coast and Western uh, performative arts, and I'm a playwright and a photographer and all y'all's relative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all related here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I think since we all like, you know, do writing um, and we do it really well by everyone's introductions. Um, why don't we talk first about like maybe early process, like when you're gonna write something or like maybe you don't even know you're gonna write it and you just end up writing it. Like what is, like basically what is your process to writing a piece? Um, I guess I can start because I start because I, I talk long. So it <laughs> stops me from talking too long. <laughs> Um, I, I've, uh, I guess my process is, you know, kind of a mix of my studies, but also I've been writing since I could write words. Seven. So I could write poetry before I learned to write a sentence. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, as long as I give myself time to write, I can write poetry anytime. Um, I think my process is motivation and the motivations for me 90% of the time are I guess kind of socialistic um, issues that happen so so rape, um, mm -hmm. uh, the climate change, missing and murdered women, uh, those issues come up and I write to them at, on a personal level but also later on when I have a grasp more of, of the news issues or what people are talking about, I'll talk, my poetry will speak to larger issues. But a lot of times it starts with how I feel about that issue. So sometimes, most times actually, it's, it's a personal uh, poem about a woman or if it's about men, about men. So I take that character, whoever I'm talking about and I write to it. Sometimes it's even animals. <laughs> So, and that makes me feel safer, I guess, using animals if I, if it's really, when I was really young to soften the blow. Also, she's, she's not saying, but she actually thinks poetically, 
even uh, when she was a really tiny little girl, everything out of her mouth was a little poem. And I, oh my God, this is so amazing. Her brain is poetic. <laughs> so when we're talking like this, this is utilitarian English, she has to actually translate in her mind to try and uh, talk like everybody else. <laughs> oh, I, I, I just have a little piece on that. I found that out uh, just after my master's degree in 2014 and I did a, a reading here at my house with a whole bunch of our theater friends that we all know and I learned from them when I came here to Ontario and my friend and I are do we're doing poetry together to kind of discipline us to actually get it into books you know to put it on paper and manage it and write more poetry so we could have a book and we did the reading and then she walked away she was saying something and then I turned around and I looked at her and she's been my friend off and on uh, for a few years, both of us doing degrees at the same time. And I realized at that instant that I was translating into sentences from poetry because I wanted to turn around and say something poetic. And I realized she's not going to understand that. And <laughs> yeah. I, within an instant, started speak, you know, speaking in sentences so you know so I told I told everybody that I was like oh my god you know I translate and it was so difficult to do essay I mean I failed the first two years of my degree uh, with essay writing luckily there was a lot of exams in between but uh, so I realized that even until my first degree that I didn't really know how to write um, prose yeah. and uh, had to learn it in your addiction especially <laughs> yeah. yeah but what about your play what was the process the beginning process oh of that? so the beginning process of my play that um uh great uncle len uh mentored me uh during my thesis he was my my mentor my only mentor during my thesis for my master's oh. it's uh yeah. Well, I was just taking the story, the history of the dance that I was learning from him. So he was doing a dance that was passed to him and he taught it to me. And that was the whole thing is teaching me this dance. And then he taught me the story behind it. He taught me, uh, I guess, the history of dance in Slate with Tooth. And writing to that, I came up with a dream of two girls dancing and then I wrote my I wrote off of that choreography that I dreamed of traditional dance and contemporary together so yeah. I, I I only watched potlatch when I was really small but in my mind I could see it and um I wrote it into my play I wrote the exact choreography that I saw in that dream and then the poetry just came and I did a lot of uh uh traditional work from here that people told me to do to keep going with where that story wanted to go, with where the dance wanted to go in the poetry from that dance that came from the working with Charlene and uh, Uncle Len. Yeah, so she followed the dance and the story. And uh, when she was talking to her uh, instructors, uh, you know, to get her masters, they were, you know, asking her all these questions. And they said, well, how do you uh, move to your poetic voice? And she looks at him. And she says, I'm ki I kind of cheat. <laughs> and she, I said, oh, my God, you don't say you cheat to your <laughs> Anyway, I almost died. <laughs> and they said, oh my God. what? And she says, yeah, I, I don't think like you're talking. I think in poetry. To talk to you, I have to translate what is going on in my mind and I have to go from the poetry to the and, and then she looks at me and I said the the prose she says yeah the prose <laughs> yeah that was during my uh defense, <laughs> yeah, defense. <laughs> but they finally settled down oh, oh, you're not really cheating <laughs> <laughs> response to that they had never heard of that from anyone that their minds thought in poetic voice and i said she's been like this since she's been speaking when she was a real little girl and this one was story she started telling stories i will talk about my first one <laughs> hey, you, <go> ahead, <laughs> you see how long the, you can tell who's the 
youngest. It's like, not only do I not get airtime, but she's going to talk for me. <laughs> I guess the, the beginning the beginning of my process is pure imagination. I don't like to box in anything I'm writing into a form until uh, I'm done um, the initial just something is in there, just get it out. So I've written a, a ton of plays. And my first draft is a draft I never show anybody because it's not a draft of a play. It might be a paragraph of something that's essayic. Uh, it might be a few poems, might be just point, uh, point form, might be a piece of a scene. And then, I'll, and then it was like, and it might be a piece of a dream or whatever, whatever needs to come out just mm -hmm. instinctively, that's the beginning of my process. And then I leave it alone for a little bit you know, for like at least a week, usually a month. And then I go back and read it as if I'm just reading it from somebody else the first time and mm -hmm. find mm -hmm. the single thread in all these weavings that makes sense. And then that becomes the story. And then I look at everything else, the clothes that thread is wearing, and then I make up my mind, this would be a great play, or this is a poem, or this is an article, or so that's, that's the very beginnings of my process uh, for anything I write, even a grant, um, which is very, it's just an essay, really, it's a really long, boring essay. <laughs> but even that, I'll just write the initial instinctual idea of what do what do I need what do does my company need or what do my students need what what is the need and then I just let myself and then I find the single thread and then the grant gets is the clothes that help to flesh out and I guess not the clothes but it fleshes out what becomes the story which is the grant so that's the beginnings of my process how about you Oh yeah, I didn't say mine. I just write. Uh, that's that, I started writing uh, Raven Song, and a week later, I had a book. Wow! I started writing uh, I Am Woman, and two weeks later, I had a book. I started writing um, my poetry it was I think three days, and I had a I have a three day novel, and a whole bunch of other things like that. I just start. But I think it's the relationship I have with my computer. I actually think my computer is a, a collaborator. Mm -hmm. And I, I say to it out loud sometimes, what are we doing today? And then something comes and I just go with it. Um, once in a while, though, I will actually struggle to write a poem. And that's I have to do that by hand. I can't do it at a computer, but it's... Mm -hmm. It's something that's churning, like like with uh, Tanya, was something's coming up, and so you've got to get it out there, kind of like like Columbo was saying too, and it takes a long time to get a poem that way. I tell you, I much prefer to just you know go say to the computer, "What's up? <laughs> what are we doing?" <laughs> it's um, funny, yeah. Uh, between what is easy to write and what is hard. I mean, easy is relative, of course, because there's nothing easy about no. writing anything, <laughs> as you know. Yeah. But I find in terms of especially playwriting, the easiest thing for me to write, and uh, uh, I'd like to do another one just because I, I don't have a lot of energy because we're doing all kinds of home renos, is I would love to do another adaptation because you have the structure already there and you have the story already yeah. there. Um, whether it's a book or a poem or uh, a children's story, whatever you're adapting from to the stage, right? So then it's just about how do I pack, how do I unpack all of this and repack it on the stage? So I find that more craft than art at the beginning. And then once you have the initial draft that you can show others, then the art kicks in. Whereas if I'm just writing from an, from an instinctual idea, it's the art first and then the craft later. But I find it like sometimes it's easier to do an adaptation because the craft is already there. Yeah. <laughs> it's just unpacking and repacking, right? 
And then uh, some of my favorite plays that I've written have come from curiosities. Like uh, I, I wrote this one woman's show and it's the only play that I've had people want to turn into uh, both a novel and a movie. And my initial um, curiosity was, I wonder if I can take West Coast or, or oral structure in terms of how we speak in a performative manner, whether it's for entertainment or, or ceremony or what have you, and put that oral structure into a Western theatrical um, frame, framework. So uh, when I wrote my one woman show Dinky, that was that came from that curiosity. And I have several plays that I went, I wonder if I can. Uh, the next thing I did with Dinky is I went, I wonder if I can write a prequel to this one woman one act play that can be its own standalone one act play, but put together with Dinky and it makes a full two act play. So Sometimes it's just curiosity as a writer and what if, I wonder if. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, I just, even this last, just this last question, I feel like I've learned so much and like, it's really interesting because I know I'm familiar with your guys' work. So it's really neat to like get the, you know, an insight, an insight to like the right. class. So that's really just, like that's really moving to like, thanks for sharing everything. Um, I've mostly wrote, I guess like for like short films at FU. So my process is mostly, um, I think of like the log line, the synopsis or just a general story. Like I'll be like, okay, I want to write a story about this. And then I will choose a main character and I'll totally develop that character and then see what characters revolve around the main one. And like, for me, that setting it up is like the part where I have to like, just like really think it out and place where like, you know, the beginning, middle and end will go. Because as soon as I start doing the dialogue, that's where it gets really like easy for me. I kind of just start <laughs> typing out the dialogue and then I'll go back and I'll look at a scene and I'll say, okay, let me tweak the scene structure so it fits the, the narrative and the overall objectives and the whole story of the, the film. So I mostly do a lot of my like writing at night. Like you wrote write a film inside out. You know, that's the only thing I studied that has to do with writing is film. <laughs> I never, I never liked doing them. <laughs> I, I just, my head, it's like, it just, just, I, I could hear the conversations in my head and it's like, yeah. I'm talking to myself. It's a very schizophrenic process because I'm just sitting here laughing and like talking. <laughs> Sometimes I'll read it out loud and I'll be like, okay, that's, yeah, that's, that's that character. I'll be like, that's Samantha. Samantha would probably say this and then this is how Rebecca would react and then I just make sure I know their characters and I'll usually base their characters off of someone I know. I'll be like oh Rebecca's kind of got like a little piece of this person and maybe a little bit of this character from this movie. So I totally like in my head I, I compartmentalize and I have a vision of who each character is so when I'm talking for them or you know, whatever. It's just like, it almost gets kind of fun and it almost just feels like I am having those conversations, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. it's very strange. And I do it at night because um, it's quiet at night and there's not much going on. Like, I think, I feel like there's a lot of distractions in the daytime or there's people phoning you, people messaging you, like kind of like, what are you doing? And, you know, you kind of like, have those little minor interruptions but then when you get to like one in the morning two in the morning three in the morning four in the morning like dead silence and that's what I'm just <laughs> having my own like little yeah. I, myself. I think that's so common with um people who create with the written word like as you get older you learn to discipline yourself to pick times other than the middle of the night but yeah. um 
or at least that's what I found just because I don't have endless energy anymore that I did even like 10 years ago but it like it always felt best in the middle of the night for some reason I don't know maybe a piece of the linear brain turns off like you're supposed to be dreaming and sleeping right so maybe that time when we're supposed to be asleep and dreaming maybe writers access the dreaming part of the brain while we're awake because it just it feels natural to write in the middle of the night <laughs> well i think you don't have any guilt about i should be doing the dishes i should be calling uh, aunt josie or whatever you know <laughs> that too, yeah. no distraction no distractions <laughs> that's so true yeah. And then, yeah go ahead go ahead try to carry a pen around with me and if i just even if i have like a little like you know like a coffee shop bag or something i'll see something and be like oh this is neat or i'll use my voice memo a lot of the time i'll just something will strike me and i'll just start talking into my voice memo and then i'll go later at like 12 or 1 and go like type it out and like feel out that idea or that like little bit of a poem that I might that might just strike me in the moment but yeah well, that's now good. that's what your phone is for <laughs> notes <laughs> Don't do well. I taught her how to write on her phone while she's traveling I so wrote I, a whole book by conversations with Canadians I bought her a bluetooth keyboard and taught her how to hook it up to her phone so she was on the airplane <laughs> Yeah. People were looking at me weird because I had the phone in the jacket and I was just banging on this keyboard and there was no computer and they were looking at me. The <laughs> lady sitting beside me asked the stewardess, can I move? Because <laughs> she thought she was sitting next to a crazy lady. And I picked up my phone and I showed her I'm actually writing something and I put it back. And, oh, okay. And then they thought it was the weirdest thing. I'm writing it and it's going on to the phone. But you could, I did a whole book that way. Um, she, okay. she also learned old school typing where you didn't have to look at the keys at all. Exactly. Right? But you didn't have to see your phone. She's no, just like, I'm just moving away. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, she was saying, I, I wish I could write while I'm traveling because I travel so much. And I said, well, yeah. use your phone because all my teenagers in Winnipeg forced me to go from my little, it didn't even have a flip, the yeah. little phone to, you, you got to get a smartphone, blah, blah, blah. Because they, they just text, right? Yeah. So finally I said, yeah, teach me how to use your iPhone or your whatever. And uh, I switched and I couldn't afford a computer right away. So I, I was writing all my grants on my phone. And it was like, wow, this is yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> my my one computer that I was using just broke down, so I had I, like an iPhone four or five or something. Some said, "Well, just hook up a keyboard to it." Like, oh. <laughs> hook a keyboard up to it. I what? Just couldn't believe it. And that is huge. <laughs> Nobody tells you how to be a writer. Like they don't tell you all these Bluetooth, all this stuff that you yeah. can get, <laughs> so that when you spontaneously, you know, are creative, which is, you know outside of Anytime. for me and yeah outside of my normal jobs or in between during my normal jobs it's like that creative juice comes up and yeah. being able to have a bluetooth anything or something that makes your whole life easier yeah and also interesting interestingly enough like just to talk about access to creativity sometimes i'll see something photographically that i love and it's not like i want to hang it on my wall but i know this has me so i'll take a picture of whatever it is and then i'll write about that when i get home about that photograph it's one of the reasons i do love film not as an actor but uh, i wrote directed and produced a short film it was like 12 minutes or something uh years ago in winnipeg and that one uh was a short play that i adapted from lee's short story <laughs> and it was one of those i wonder if i can do the west coast tell it diff, tell it back different but the same exercise with this story mm -hmm. and so uh i took just one sliver of that story it's, it was a, a, a story called dear daddy so i took the letter writing portion of that whole story and made that the short play 
and then got a grant to do a short film. So then I took that short play <laughs> and turned it into a film, a film script. <laughs> so, so it's like, uh, and then so I got to see the film. <laughs> yeah, she actually produced the film. <laughs> that was amazing. But yeah. that's my interest in film, really. If I was gonna get, try to seriously get in film, I'd love to be a cinematographer because my eye is photographic. Even when I'm writing plays, I look, what is the composition of this? Mm. What does the picture look like? But that's part of the crafting. That's, sorry, that's not my initial part of the process, right? That's just the, the imaginings coming, the dream flowing from you. But at a certain point, what I love about crafting uh, a play or um, film, mostly plays, is what is the picture of this? What is the weight of this picture? What is the audience going to feel? You know, because in film you can push, you can pull, you can pan, you can crossfade. And so you're looking, the whole stage acts as that, but, but uh, it's it's all happening in one sheet, right? So you, you look at the lights and the sound and the set and how can those help push or pull focus? How, you know, you're still thinking cinem cinematography in it, but instead of dissolving from one scene to another, you're doing that with light or you're doing that with sound or fl slurring one end of one scene into the next, right? So it's how do I translate those cinema, cinema, cinematic skills into a play? <laughs> I love doing that because I'm a photographer. Sorry, am I not allowing you to speak? No, I'm I'm gonna... <laughs> well, I already thought. <laughs> she hasn't thought yet. <laughs> Making my brain like I love photography too, so I'm really clicking with everything you're saying. <laughs> but um, Daniel, you're talking about social issues um, earlier, and I feel like, like in one way or another, like even being Indigenous and being First Nations women, I feel like a lot of what we've wrote at one time or another has been affected by, like, social situations or inspired by things, and challenges, or um, just life experiences that First Nations women go through, and like maybe like. My next question is like, how do social situations as a First Nations person like affect or inspire like your writing? Affecting my writing, I think, I don't, um, I, when I was in school, there was social issues that I heard through other people, um, like the rape poem that I wrote that, you know, I don't know what happened to it, but it was inspired by two women who were talking about rape in a lab, actually, where we were all supposed to be quiet. So they were talking about it, and then I got inspired to do that poem. And so I, you know, I ran downstairs first to eat, and then I went ran back upstairs to write it. And um, so that sort of thing inspires me when I have the time, like. I allowed myself, like I was during my, I said, well, so I have a 15 minute break so I can write this poem. <laughs> How social issues affect me is probably more, especially with this book. Like when I think of the horses poem, when you're talking about how it affects women, how it affects our bodies. I wrote a horses poem, but I remember I had an accident while I was in my first degree, a bike accident. And I think at the last two years of my degree, which is when after the accident, I, I totally lost feeling uh, of self. Like even just walking down the street, I couldn't feel my feet and stuff like that. And, and so, um, and I know that's a coping mechanism, but I think it's really, it relates to me to this book because um, our bodies, my body, I shouldn't say ours, my body as a woman needs to feel free to feel like writing. Mm -hmm. When I don't feel free, I don't feel like writing. My first year, I did the most writing that I did overall, but I did writing throughout because, you know, all my years, because every year I had a visiting professor that I took every class that he, he had, he was teaching. 
and in that room I was able to write but all my other you know three classes a year or whatever they were two classes a year I, I didn't really write poetry uh, except for one class um, I did write poetry and it was an Italian literature class so the impact the social impact is totally by the people there and and you know I'm a colored person right so and, and so a lot of it was color. I took world literature, but I was the only native person taking world literature. Uh, in the, you know, I did part time, so six years of study that I did. So uh, I was very much the only brown person in 99% of my classes. So uh, I really tried to love the people I was with. And they helped love me, they, they love me too, because you know, I. They thought I was Sicilian or they thought it was whatever. <laughs> Italian. <laughs> um, so they were trying to love me too. And I know that. And to, to grab hold of that and keep that in my heart while I was doing all these studies really helped me to love these people and to have that exchange and, and, and come to grips also with how other people are racialized beyond just being brown, but and in, in whatever industrial capitalist system they were in how they were oppressed in it and so it enabled me to love people more and to see beyond myself because being a poet especially a poet I could just get into myself and my pains and my responses to what's happening around me mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it enacted the social activism in me that was beyond just you know being a native woman in a school in you know single mother you know doing world literature it, it expanded that all for me and it enabled me to include people on a huger scale i've got to get a chair for my mom i'll be back in a second <laughs> i'll let her talk <laughs> my back is sore <laughs> we have to go get <laughs> Your turn. Oh, it's my turn to talk. I wasn't ready. <laughs> I want to wait for your chair, Columbo? Could you go? What's the what's the the uh, what's the sub what's the subject? Question. Um, just how, yeah, what's the question? how like social um like situate like um well me and Tanya what she brought up like some of her writing and stuff that comes from school is like um just like how um, how social issues affect oh, your writing okay i, I think that um, <laughs> i come from a family as you know <laughs> my brother was going across the country with his brother-in-law they were actually running across the country from vancouver to the to nova scotia and my auntie irene says so what's the issue <laughs> And, uh, the, my aunt Marie says, "You know, this family doesn't do anything without an issue, <laughs> a cause, <laughs> a cause. <laughs> That's it, a cause." And I said, "I, I think seeing if two old men could make it is the cause." <laughs> they start <laughs> laughing. They said, "We should give him a cause." And so they start making up all these causes that the boys could carry across the country, and we couldn't stop laughing. But that's that's been our life i mean starting with Capilano and going down to chief george and to chief dan george and Ta -a and all these miranda all these people in our in our history there's always been something of a social uh, consciousness that we don't just think of ourselves yourself is in a context and you see yourself in that context and if the context is good and safe then you make it better by uh, being the best you can be in that good and safe context. But if it's not, then you make it good and safe for your children so that they can be good and safe in that in better context. So you're always looking out after the social and that becomes uh, a way of expressing yourself later on when I realized that writing was a way of making breath tracks last forever. Your voice is never lost. It's on that piece of paper right there. <laughs> and so I decided that I would get published when I was quite young. 
and it took me a while to get good enough to get published or get someone to publish me. I actually uh, was quite aggressive about getting uh, them to publish Indigenous people because they had only one Indigenous person published when I was young, and that was Pauline Johnson. And she was half white, her mother was white. And so they considered her basically white. And that's why they published her, you know, it's like, oh my God, this is so nuts. Anyway, they, they eventually did start publishing indigenous um, people in the seventies. And uh, I know that I had a lot to do with that. I was very aggressive about making sure that well, if you're gonna do this, then you have to have so many indigenous writers also. And then I would get indigenous people writing so that, that we'd have people to publish because nobody was writing. What do you want to write for? <laughs> you know? No, no, it was weird. But I said, no, no, come on, let's, let's get together and write. And so we'd have these little workshops at my house. And these guys were like little tiny children and they, they were part of that process of getting people to write. And I, I'm telling you, it was like a, a prairie gas at grass fire. Everybody started doing it. And, and we've just had so many published since then and so many really great writers come out of, especially the younger generation, people like yourself. I'm really uh, happy that I was, I can't do this by myself, guys. <laughs> I need another name on the page. <laughs> I think for me, uh, whether it's a poem or a play or a photograph or any kind of writing, or art, it always comes from the personal for me. And in the crafting of whatever I'm doing, I come to recognize the social value or context of what it is I am doing inside this story. But um, I think of it as a sociological and psychological. The psychological is the very intimate kernel of the story which then becomes a singular character journey inside of a play and the sociological sort of umbrella housing it is the world from which they come from right the world in, uh, that they live in but I, I i've always sort of moved from that inside spark out here into the story and then recognize the sociological sort of umbrella that um, is or should be housing these psychological journeys of characters, right? But that to me has always kind of been last to the personal, the internal personal spark for the for story. Yeah, I don't think I'd write if it was just personal. Oh yeah, it's yeah. too hard. Yeah, there's has yeah. that inspiration. I didn't say it was just personal. Yeah, so, yeah, move from that out into the instead. I, I wouldn't do it if I had to do that. That's why that all have like varieties, right? Variety is good, and everyone yeah. beautiful and different in their own way. And yeah, yeah, I think I think one of the things that you know, what Lee and Compa's little talk for a second here was, um. I think as a writer, you're having to really, just like a, a theater person, a thespian, you really have to look at yourself and know what inspires you, what motivates you, what you are capable of doing mm -hmm. to affect change or to, you know, in a play to, you know, go, go through the change in the play. So for me, I like to fix things. I'm mm -hmm. a fixer. So, um, and I'm a poet, so it's easy for me to write poetry, but when I see rape as a culture inside mm. another culture that's trying not to rape everybody, mm. I go, how do we fix this? And so when I write poems, even though the, the inspiration is to write the poem, uh, the, my own personal, I don't know, system in myself is to fix. So in my poem, I wrote about you know, how to, and then, you know, I wrote the poem to that to somehow, how are we going to fix this? How, somehow, and we, I say we, because I work from that aspect too, where it's not, 
just me doing something because I don't feel confident enough that I can affect change by myself. And I'm a very people person. So it's always what can make it change, whether it's tradition that comes out in my poem or unity. A lot of my poems are about unity. A lot of them are about nature. A lot of them are about uh, someone's struggle that's either already existed mm. or I want to exist. Yeah. to make something change on a social you know a, a social or bigger uh in the bigger world now well, that's beautiful like when you say a fixer like that's the kind of content like I look for like when I you know go to a bookstore I'm like I want something that's yeah. gonna like, fix you know fix my heart fix my mind it's something that I could read and read, yeah. actually take me to another place and it'll to connect with that writer to, to connect with that narrative so I don't feel alone and like yeah. the way you say it is so beautiful like you say I'm a fixer I want to help fix because that's really what a lot of authors you know it's, whether they know it or not that's like kind of like what they're doing in yeah. any genre yeah so, that's true <laughs> it's, it's funny like, like it. I I never think of writing like that at all <laughs> in the beginning in the beginning yeah but because you have the psychological and sociological once you recognize what that is then you can come to consciousness if you work like me um of of that potentially fixing something but most of the time when i write it's exposing mm -hmm. like Either I'm trying, either I want to create a world that doesn't exist as a, a, an inspirational move towards something, or I want to expose something that does exist. I, I very much like to put the fixing in the hands of the audience. Yes. You know, like the story, theatrically speaking, anyway, I think uh, I find the journey writing poetry different, but in terms of writing plays, I find, yeah, you got to have a conclusion and a resolution in your play, but I find that I, I, I try to structure things so that the audience goes away thinking, I can do this, mm. right? Better than this character did in the play or better than, you, you know, I, but I can do this. I, I want them leaving feeling like that. And, and then the story that they've seen becomes the vehicle for that journey. It's like, the play is sort of the front lines bringing this story to the audience and it the magic really in my own imagining is when the audience leaves with the story and takes that story into their own little worlds that's where magic can happen right but i never thought of it as a fixer <laughs> yeah interesting yeah yeah because i i mean and the fixer when i i don't actually think of what i'm writing when i write poetry but i know innately inside myself just from how I've done things through my whole life I've been a fixer mm. I've tried to fix every situation so when I read and know when I think of some of my poems I know I'm either trying to fill a gap or I'm trying to fix something mm. um and to me most of our problems is the gaps you know reserves are truncated our tradition only elements that are, of it are allowed in in Canadian society American also so so you know my I think my part in the world is something to do with filling those gaps is going okay making the bridges so that we don't have to just have you know smudging as the only thing we're allowed to do in university um so that's that's what I think about my fixing and you know trying to be the you know put the putty in the the crack <laughs> <laughs> I feel so irresponsible you know the first time I did thought I could write a poem I was reading uh, the center will not hold and I just thought oh my god that's so beautiful <laughs> it's like a song <laughs> and so then I started thinking of poetry as the lyricism of the narrative the story the mm -hmm. story the lyricism of the story and I started taking my stories and taking out a lot of the does and ands and as and that and therefore and all that kind of stuff <laughs> and I found the poetry in it hmm. And I just I just started reading that out uh, to people and they, oh, that's really nice poem. 
and then I knew it was poetry. <laughs> and someone said, how do you know that's poetry? And I said, see how it looks on the page. <laughs> mm -hmm. You just take all the, the excess out of the narrative and you've got the poem. And that mm -hmm. allows you to sing the story, mm -hmm. which, you know, you wouldn't if it was, well, we were, it was Friday night and we were all in our cars, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's so dull and boring. You can't sing that out, but you can as the cars are parked. We spill out of them. We're dancing in this, you know what I mean? Like you're you're starting to get the rhythm of the song. And Headlights, the highlight, the low light, light of my life. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we got home. <laughs> yeah. That's what I like about poetry. Um, the thing I like about story though is that if you don't like the way this story's going, write it over. <laughs> change it. That's what I always tell people. You don't like how the story of your life's going? Change it. <laughs> how do I change it? First write a different one and then try to live it. <laughs> I would say I would say one thing because I mean I'm I'm 51, so so uh, I have a lot more years on you. But when I was really young, I wasn't really conscious of of the writing process or anything. I just you know, poem would want to come out and I'd go, where's a pencil and pen? You know, if I had one, I'd write it down. Uh, during my degree, my mom told me to write poetry because I was wanting to give up because I couldn't write an essay in my first year. Yeah. Um, and she said, write poetry in between your pages, leave a page up and, and write poetry on that page. But now as a, a, you know, person who's gone along for a while, it's that I'm becoming more conscious that of my writing process. Like I don't see an end goal. I don't see, like, say I'm writing a story. I don't see the end of the story. I just, whatever wants to come out in the pen is whatever comes out. Usually it's a beautiful image. And then I write that image and then stuff starts coming after. And it's, I'm really good when somebody gives direction. So if they're doing 15 minutes of writing, don't stop writing until you've done 15 minutes. So, so that gets me to, you know, motivates me. Uh, when it's myself, it's usually something that's happened out in the outer world. But being more conscious of myself, I'm able to see, you know, a lot of my poems are, are, are end up being what I am, what I feel I am. Um, I don't, like my horse, horse poem or the Cedar Bart Strip Moon poem, I was never conscious of what the end product was going to be or what I was thinking of each line. It was just, this came out. And this is my response to my sister's um, line of poetry that she started with. Um, I just know that a lot of my work seems to really be that, to go, I am going to facilitate somehow in my subconscious mind that I'm going to help some, somebody out there. Like, you know, even in my play, and I said, even if, you know, one person learns something out of this about who they are and how they can manage in this system that's something that's mm -hmm. something to me and that's that's what i want i don't i don't want to say that i'm going to fix everybody but i'm saying here's something i'm going to put it out there and maybe somebody will see who's been raped or who's been a brown person or who's been you know and that's what's motivated me to publish. Before that, I didn't even think of publishing till Hope Matters. I was, you know, my mom's been talking about it for years to try to get me to. But the motivation of that is to inspire that in other people. Because before that, I never wanted to publish. I'm just, you know, a writer. I, I like to write. I like to do story. I like, I studied everything that I wanted to study, except for maybe two courses, my science course and something else. But I learned to love it, you know. I learned to love the courses that I didn't really want to do, that you had to do for the degree. But all the writing courses were ones that I totally wanted to study. I didn't study any canon writers. <laughs> well, the, the European study. canon. I did to indigenous canon, I believe. <laughs> Ours are boats and arrows. There's his cannons. <laughs> the cannons versus the boats and arrows. <laughs> Oh my <laughs> She's silly. <laughs> Grandma Carter, mom's mom used to say, I, I always remember this is there's an infinite number of ways to the center, center of a circle. circle. 
And if the story, if the creation of a story is the center of a circle, then there's an infinite number of ways to get to that story. It just, I think that's what's really personal as someone who creates written works or any kind of art really, is that you can come at it by from a very internal place or you can sit or you can come at it from a sociological place or sometimes people come at it just you know we have a buddy who's who writes two hours a day no matter what yeah. rain or shine mm. doesn't matter if he even has an idea in his head two hours a day i write and some then he'll go back on all his two hours a day and go oh there's something here yeah. right there's all kinds of ways. So that's, I think that's also the beauty of it. And talking to other writers like yourself across generations, like there's something beautiful, I think, in familial intelligence mm. and expertise. Mm. And I wish more Indigenous people across Turtle Island and around the world would stand up for, would stand up and hold that up. Like, wouldn't it be cool if Ta'a and then her and then our generation and your generation and came even together, yeah. all of those generations of intelligences and the ki little kids generation coming up from you? Because that's how our cultures work. Yeah. Oh, so wait, right? another question right there. So like, mm -hmm. like, including like, how would we include the youth in the process and like why is that so important and it's oh, like yeah. you're saying it like right now it's just like yeah well i think we like for myself um i think we we help each other forward i think there's something uh deliberate in age at least from my 50 years i move more deliberately now than when i had all kinds of energy <laughs> And uh, when I was younger, I would just go, oh, yeah, we should go here. Yeah, yeah let's do this. And I was more popping and cracking. <laughs> and I don't think it's, I think it's dangerous to lose that, which is one of the reasons I've always liked working with young people, mm -hmm. because they keep me connected to a future that mm -hmm. I am, even though I'm getting closer to the end, which is futuristic, I'm more settled in this space. So. I think I always need someone to keep me moving forward. And that's young people oh. because they have boundless energy on top of intelligence, right? So they can, they can just go. And then I need the expertise of the people behind me, right? I, I often talk to my mom about, you know, what am I, even just as a middle-aged woman, what am I in for in the company, right? this is what to expect when you get this age and that. And she's been talking to me about that since I became a woman, really. So there's an intergenerational um, helping each other that happens culturally for us that I think, um, to me, if I, if I uh, create that way, it keeps me connected to, to who I am more. I feel more whole. We have um, creative processes that are collective. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as we engage those processes, I don't think it matters whether there's young people in the room or not. Mm -hmm. We're not around very many young people right these days. Uh, but I always created a uh, story and poetry collectively. And mm -hmm. at usually in my living room or my dining room, around the kitchen table, the porch, the porch. <laughs> now it's the porch, poetry on the porch with Lee. And I would invite people along and I would not make them all participate. <laughs> I terrify some people <laughs> because they, you want me to write poetry? I remember Daniel Jalaga, I don't write poetry. And so I took her book and I pulled some of the, the, uh, non non prose poet, poetic words out of the uh text and i started reading it she says oh my god i do write poetry <laughs> so then i would i would do that with people and i think people don't realize that they have a literary voice they don't realize it until you show them how to get to it easily and once they have that then they are there with you and sometimes we also come up with a line like uh, you were talking about prior to the park strip move we're, we're kind of chuckling about that because it's in hope matters she came up with the line 
let's write a poem about crying to the Bart Strip Moon. Everybody has to use that line. I think you used it toward the end. I used it at the beginning. You used it in the middle, but it doesn't matter how you use it. It's just that somewhere in that poem, the cry to the bark strip moon has to be there. And so then you get three really different poems, three different, really different perspectives, yeah. different rhythms, different sounds, different uh, objectives mm -hmm. in the poetry. And it becomes very, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you come together mm -hmm. over a single line. And I think that's another way to get to uh, young people. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when young people are there, if you say, let's, let's do a poem with Cry to the Bark Strip Move, they're right there. Because you've, you've done the hard work of finding the line, mm -hmm. which is the, the beginning. You, you found the beginning for them. You found the subject for them. You found the destination, the pathway. You've got their brain going. So you, have, you need to do that when, you're with, when there's young people in the room. And I think using our collective processes is the best way to come up with poetry for anyone and to write. And then you talk about how that poem is a very short story. It's a distilled story and you can change it into a narrative, mm -hmm. a story, or you can change it into an essay or you can, you know, you can do anything with it once you've got the poem. The poem is the science of all art oh, and all okay. language. Funny, I, I, just to say one more thing that I, I uh, wanted to mention, when I was working in Winnipeg, I wanted to get some of the young, the youth artists introduced to the theater world. And the way that I did that is I called on a bunch of favors from established writers who were playwrights, poets, essayists, short story writers, <laughs> filmmakers, and said, give me a monologue. Uh, and I, we had a theme. I said, this is the, this is the project. Monological. <laughs> yeah, I called it monological. This is the project. I want to introduce young writers by experience and by age into the world of writing. What better way to do that than have people who are already doing the work and masters at their craft pull forward those young folks. So. Uh, I paired emerging artists with established artists and created a, a show that was monologue based um, and produced it. Yeah. Wow. Oh. And then the next step was mentorship. And I found one monologue by the youth artist that matched her monologue. Yeah. And then I paid for the young artist to come out here and mentor with Lee yeah. to turn those two monologues into one one woman show yeah she did the she performed the one woman show which yeah. was really really cool i think i think for me um i i get a lot of i'm i'm the selfish one here so i i get a lot of energy from, from the young people you know and i worked a couple of projects with you but um i'm a very uh, physical person and so uh you know being able to keep up with the young people kind of motivates me but it also I'm competitive so it makes me compete with them too <laughs> and they never win when they're just beginning but you know hopefully I hope you know is that I'll inspire them to do you know physical stuff or creative stuff and then they'll be better than me mm -hmm. um I think at my age I realize that young people know today they know the issues on a deeper level than I do because I, as a human being and as myself, sometimes can be embittered or blocked by my own history um, and also by time. You know, nine to five, I have, I've had to keep a normal job, whether it be contract or, you know, permanent jobs that had nothing to do with what I wanted to do with my life you know, probably 70 to 80% of the time. Um, so all the times I actually did projects with youth or I did it with recreation, which is only three years out of the last 15, it was with people who wanted to make change. And mm -hmm. the people who have time to talk to me or to learn from me were young people. 
mm. or who saw me as somebody that they could learn from was a young person. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's the value of young people to me because I feel I have something to say. I feel from my own familial history and from all that we've learned from the time I was, you know, one years old and learned from my parents or, or learned on the street or learned from all these people around me, like, you know, not just my family and not just the streets, but everything in between my studies, all those people I learned stuff with, I can help these young people be better people and, mm -hmm. and, and overcome struggles that they're struggling with today that when I was 20, I never had to freaking struggle with. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to struggle with climate change. I didn't have to struggle with the coronavirus. I didn't have to struggle with H1N1. I didn't have to struggle with the knowing that 1,200 of us were killed and that's the women that were found because they could kill Native women. I didn't have a struggle with that. I struggled day to day with things that weren't talked about by people of my mom's age and our leaders, whether it be academics or, you know, now we have people who are lawyers and stuff who are able to talk about that stuff and do something about it mm -hmm. on a grander scale than when we were teenagers. When we were teenagers, we created a team group outside of all our friends, except for two, and then we are able to manifest with Klumpa's ideas and ways of getting people together, people who were actually gonna make social change as youth. So we, we crashed meetings, you know, in, in, because there were no youth meetings. <laughs> so it was indigenous, you know, all these kinds of different meetings for, for different things and indigenous meetings were, were a big thing then. And, you know, Klumpa spoke and, and my, the other two Simsian people that were there spoke. Uh, youth that were there so so we we you know knock down these doors and I want youth today inside the systems that I never grew up in be able to knock down doors that I didn't even imagine were going to be you know opened or anything back 20 years ago I mean I did imagine that we would do something about residential school because that's why we did it we were trying to knock down doors you know 30 years ago that are now being spoken to mm -hmm. on a mass level where before it was four of us and then you know and then for the movies and the dances and other things there was like you know 50 to 100 of us but for the you know the socialism of it beyond uh the group the community that we were around because i say going to dance you know, making dances happen, making tennis matches, looking after little kids is a socialism, socialism unto itself. Mm -hmm. But going to these big meetings, we were challenging uh, adults mm -hmm. to look at youth as speakers of the moment. We knew the moment. We, we, we were struggling so hard. And I think this is the huge thing about young people, as Klumpo was saying, they struggle so hard. You guys struggle so hard to learn something, to understand it. As older people, we're very analytic. We're all we're looking at a lot more than just the moment, mm -hmm. and I think that brings me forward. At, besides the energy and my own nurturing self mm -hmm. that wants to mother, and I think in this state that we're in, so many of us being being uh, oppressed by climate change, by, you know, the exploiters of, of climate, the exploiters of children, the ex all the exploiters out there, that we were, we are able to affect change as older people with youth and youth look to us to go, where are the answers? Because we have never had the framework to voice for ourselves and, and affect change. It's always been oppressed. I've had so many youth come to me, why don't you know, saying, why don't we have athletes? Why don't we have, you know, Harry Potter writers? You know, all these things. And I say, every time we tried to do it in the 50s and 60s, we were stopped. It was banned. We were banned as a people, whether it be at the academic level, at the professional the, or the government level, or just in our communities, not being able to walk outside and go to the next reserve or go outside to get a lawyer or go outside to to have a protest. We wouldn't, weren't able to leave reserves, but now we can, but of course, you know, we may be arrested. <laughs> That's funny. Cause 
me and Tanya's generation is the first generation to be allowed to gather in more uh, groups of more than was it three or four? Five. Five? Yeah. And even though it was illegal to stop native people from gathering in more than those groups, we had one more native kid than whatever the number was in high school. Yeah. And they told us not to, I, I think it was four of us. Yeah. One, mm -hmm. two, there's four of us. And they said, you can't gather in more than groups of three. This was a progressive, leftist private non-religious private school oh yeah and we were like what like and we knew this law doesn't <laughs> yeah. exist anymore yeah but there you said there's four of you you look like a gang so that's <laughs> yeah. we're the first generation to be allowed legally to gather so i think every generation has an expertise in time not just creativity but there is an expertise that we all have generationally speaking in our own time. Yeah. And I think that's why that intergenerational familial intelligence, intergenerational transmission of knowledge across nations is so important because there's things, it was illegal, you know, when she was born, she was not a citizen of this country. No. She became a citizen of this country when she was a preteen. Yeah, I was 12. <laughs> And she wasn't allowed to gather her generation and Ta's generation weren't allowed to gather in more than groups of three or four yeah on the, on the streets in vancouver north vancouver yeah and some of our <laughs> my uncles you know your great uncles and so on weren't allowed to gather together at all mm -hmm. like andy paul wasn't allowed to stand next to katsalano <laughs> talk to him <laughs> he had to go find somebody else and and Katsalana would stand back and listen <laughs> because the, the conversation was intended for Katsalana, but he'd be saying it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And the somebody else would be looking at Andy thinking, what the hell is he talking about? But it was for someone else that he was talking. And I think that's a huge thing that they're getting to is that, and we talked about this in the last Zoom meeting, is that because we're not in ta taught Indigenous history and, and how, Don't freak you out. know, the past system worked and that we weren't allowed to gather and be on the street with more than, you know, three, well, three people for me and my three sister or, four or something like that, um, that, uh, it's <laughs> your dog, <laughs> it's okay, <laughs> look at the puppies, look at the puppies, he wants his grandma, yeah, yeah I totally forgot what I was going to say, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> no, I think those are really good points, though, because, and that's the, the good thing that we have you guys as writers because these stories and like a lot of Canadians don't believe that they're like oh that's not true like oh that's just made up or they'll be like oh why is everyone still talking about this I don't want to think about it it makes me so uncomfortable and <laughs> sorry they're so self-centered <laughs> Oh, I asked, that's what I did. I actually asked UBC oh. if they would look, if they would uh, check their archives for history and make it accessible to all of, all of the native people who it's about. Mm -hmm. So, so mom was able to get into the archives to look at stuff about Chief Dan George, but nobody is allowed to go in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, she was able to go in there because she was doing research, but all she tried to get in there, but they, they had to make a lot of calls for her to get in there. So just having access to our own history, mm -hmm. let alone have it in, you know, we're trying to get into post-secondary, we're trying to get into secondary and, you know, elementary school. We don't have just normal access to our own history, yeah. books about yeah. anybody. Most so, of our history is in the United States. Yeah, mm -hmm. most, of, yeah, a lot of museum stuff, a lot of our historical, uh, books are all in the states because they have less laws around restricting us from our own history than they do in the states yeah. even though people everybody says the states is worse canada is worse to us yeah. than the states is worse to their the native americans down yeah. there in terms of access to in yeah. terms of access and information yeah that's why we can write about it yeah <laughs> that's why we gotta write about it <laughs> I think um, we've been on for about almost an hour and a half. Oh my God. <laughs> we're done, eh? Well, all you had to do is ask us one question. <laughs> <laughs> no, it went by really fast. Like I looked at, I can see, like there's a timer that tells us how long we've been on Zoom. And yeah, yeah it's like 128. But I, I noticed it at like 
115 but I was like oh but I just want to keep going <laughs> <You're like laughs> we'll have to do it again then <laughs> yeah let's do a part two <laughs> part two <laughs> and you and I was gonna say that another thing is you know so much like um we had a meeting uh, not this last zoom we did but the zoom before and this girl said something I was like oh my god she was able to say something that it's taken me 50 years to figure out you know when she was 20 maybe 25 24 so you guys have 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 an intelligence that it's is far beyond what i know even though i've been through you know lived on the you know been you know around street people or whatever 50 years of living that it's so far ahead of me that i can learn and i you know say, same when i'm talking to my daughter there's so much we can learn from you guys that we don't already know because you live this is your time this is when you're gathering information and trying to you know decide what to put in your basket and some of you just throwing shit in there but you know you're throwing all this stuff in your basket you know and i'm so old i'm just like don't want to put anything else in there um <laughs> so i'm able to see <laughs> that you know you're taking it out <laughs> it's really interesting like the whole rhetoric around children are our future but mm -hmm. I agree with Tanya. I think youth is about the now. Mm -hmm. If you want to know what's happening in the world right now, yeah. ask a young person. Just like I wish somebody had asked us when we were young, what's happening in the world right now? Yeah. Because you are the most powerless when you're the younger you are, the less power you have, right? So you, mm -hmm. you, you graduate from high school, you've got no job experience, you've yeah. got no, no life experience. Yeah in yeah. terms of uh generally speaking of course in terms of renting or buying a house or buying a car or you you have no credit history so you don't exist on the planet <laughs> you, you you can't vote till you're 18. there's all kinds of things that stop you from being powerful so once you get out of those sort of struggle of years into your 20s and you master gathering knowledge and then you're in your 30s you feel planted and then you know there's different stages to life but if you want to know about the struggles of the world you need to ask young people because maybe there are future in terms of procreation maybe some of them are going to have kids i don't know but they're the people of the now yeah. if there's a, if there's people who struggle the yeah. most it's young people i mean look at now it's going to be impossible for some 16 year old right now in five years to think of owning a house in a major city in this country yeah you know my my dad was telling me i, I said we're economically was it worse when you were a kid than what i live in now this is about 10 years ago and he goes no um it's worse now than it ever was his dad was a worker was worked on the tracks single income earner raised seven kids and had a wife who stayed at home yeah. and was able to afford to buy a car and a house my yeah. parents couldn't afford to do any of that and now it just gets worse every generation so yeah the struggles of the the struggles the world is going through you need to always ask young people generationally throughout all the generations so yeah i agree they're people of the now yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um do you guys have any last like insight on the, the any last words? No, thank you. Uh, it was oh. a very nice conversation. <laughs> Leave afraid we've took too much time. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I it went it flew by. It was like it did, yeah. <laughs> so much great information all condensed. Yeah. Like, I'm glad it's recorded. Yeah. <laughs> really good. Posterity. Oh, and thank you guys so much for like hanging out today and talking. Yeah, it was great. And I can't re wait to read your play in uh, the production uh, draft or whatever it is you want to share. Yeah. You. Like, give me an email on on um, inbox, and I'll send you what I have so far. Great. Okay. Let's get it. And and next week we'll phone you and, and we'll test you on the uh, information we gave you today. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember. It's stuck. 
It's burned into my brain. All the <laughs> Don't test me. Don't test me either. <laughs> don't ask me what I said because I don't remember anything. <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, we love you. And we're going to go put in a floor in your Auntie Lee's bedroom now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like this. yeah the heart. <laughs> the heart. <laughs> Thank you.